Welcome to our session, New Strategies for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at U.S. Universities and Employers. My name is Malaika Serrano, and I have the joy of serving as the VP for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Guild, and I will be your moderator today. Guild is an education platform that connects employers and high-value learning providers to create opportunities for a diverse workforce. In today's session, we will evaluate DEI strategies that many U.S. institutions and employers have implemented, identifying those that can really help students succeed within academia and throughout their careers. Now, I am very excited to introduce two panelists and friends of mine, Matthew Daniel and Kate Kraft. As the principal consultant at Guild, Matthew Daniel leads research and thought leadership on topics such as the intersection of learning and development and DEI talent trends based on economic indicators, mobility, and the future of work. He works with current and prospective Fortune 500 clients to put together plans to upskill and reskill their talent to be ready for the future of work. Kate Kraft has over a decade of strategy and innovation experience throughout the global education ecosystems, having worked with high schools, universities, nonprofits, philanthropies, accreditors, and corporate entities on a diverse array of topics, ranging from education to work pathways to new program design. In her current role as a principal of Guild Solutions Exploration Team, she leads the expansion of Guild's short form credit bearing programs. Now here's something that you won't find on their official bios. Both Kate and Matthew are exemplary DEI champions right here at Guild. Both are inaugural members of our DEI Council, and Kate is the first chair of our Gender and Sexuality Diversity Employee Resource Group. So now here's a look at today's agenda. We're going to go through the current state of inequity, burgeoning employer interests, key challenges underrepresented students face, equity strategies for academic institutions, the potential for impact, and of course, holding space for Q&A. And so now I'm gonna turn things over to my good friend, Matthew Daniel. Hello, everyone. I will move quickly through some of the data that we have here because I really wanna make sure we have enough time to get through Kate's uh, meaty information that she's going to share with us. What you're seeing on the screen is some data that really is a driver for us. At Guild, given that we sit at this intersection of uh, learning institutions and uh, employers, it's critical that we take a look at how employers are looking at this challenge and how we continue to have impact. And so one of the pieces that we talk most with employers about is that there's not a challenge around uh, equity when it comes to having employees, uh, BIPOC employees specifically. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is lots of diversity sitting in most organizations. The challenge is it sits in the front line. You're seeing on the screen right now uh, some data that comes from CPE, uh, CEPR, which shows uh, the high concentration of BIPOC employees sitting in frontline roles versus at uh, mid-level management and executive roles. And here's what we also know is that for Black employees, quit rates under managers of their own race, 19% lower, whereas promotions are 79% higher. So employers in America have a problem, and that problem is that the systems, the processes that have been put in place um, both within the workplace and outside of the workplace are impacting access to education, access to leadership uh, and other pieces. If we'll go to the next slide, just a couple more data points. And for those of you uh, who are in education, which I would assume is all of you, you are familiar with the impacts of education on income. And so if we think about the bottom quintile of wealth distribution in America, 65% of black Americans sit in that bottom quintile, as opposed to 11% of white Americans. If we think about those raised in the bottom quintile, if they don't earn a college degree, 47% are stuck there. However, if they earn a college degree, uh, only 10% stay. 62% um, of Americans are in the top quartile um, who graduated, excuse me, let me say that differently, in the top quartile of Americans, 62% 
have graduated from college versus the bottom quartile, well, only 16%. If you know anything about Guild, you know that we partner with organizations like Walmart, uh, the Walt Disney Company, Chipotle, and others to help uh, elevate uh, their talent on the front lines through degrees and formal education. And so what you're seeing on the bottom of the screen is a Walmart employee uh, where she said, if I, if I finish, if I get my degree, I can keep working myself up. This is the starting point for her. And for her financially, it opens doors. And if you watch, there's a video that goes with this. She looks at her daughter and she says, and hopefully she never feels it. That is the work that we're doing day to day at Guild to help make sure that we're um, getting through employer relationships access to education. Go to that next slide, if you would, where we talk a little bit about how are employee, employers thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so there are four main buckets. Um, if you go back one, it's all good. Uh, the, there are four main buckets, and this is a range through the talent life cycle. We think about how uh, outside, and I just want to make sure, confirm that you all can still hear me. So I'm just, just making sure because it looks frozen on my screen. Okay, wonderful. So in those, in those pieces, employers are looking to strengthen their external brand and attraction. They really want to make sure that they are bringing talent in. They know it's important. It's not just important because it's the right thing to do. It's important because their business outcomes tied to it. Uh, employers, companies who are not hiring representative talent will not be able to market. They will not be able to communicate. They will not create the products that a diverse consumer base is looking for. And the American consumer is changing. They are different than they looked 20 years ago. And if businesses want to succeed, they need talent internally that can help them prepare for it. That next area that we talk about is acquisition and development. Now, here's the thing. Many employers are thinking about BIPOC talent from an acquisition standpoint. They're partnering with HBCUs, which we encourage them to do, but they're partnering with HBCUs in an effort to make sure that they bring fresh talent in from HBCUs. Our response is, hey, look at the data. You have a robust, diverse workforce. If you will tap into those folks on the front line, make investments in your own talent. So instead of uh, just an acquisition decision from an employer standpoint, it's about development. Engagement is that next place that we talk about. Employers are looking to make sure that the existing talent, BIPOC talent, uh, gender and sexual diversity, all of those forms, neurodiverse um, employees will stay engaged. And so they're thinking about new ways, new content, new approaches, new opportunities to make sure that those employees stay engaged. And finally, employers are looking for ways to hold accountable their own organization and make sure there's pressure coming from the SEC to be more uh, robust with the data published for public uh, companies. <clears throat> And so it's critical that employers are actually working to measure the outcomes because there will be a time that consumers or the federal government will expect that they're held accountable to it. The final slide that I'm going to cover, and I'm concerned that you all can't see it, but I'll cover the data with you because I have it on my screen to make sure that we can get to it if we need to, is that um, we want to just t think about these students in particular. We just finished, yeah, that's the slide. We just finished a deep body of research where we started to look at uh, the students that we have uh, and what is their experience. And what we heard from these students is that they're highly motivated. When they talk about their own success, they're citing their inner strength as the reason that they overcome. What they are not talking about is systemic inequalities. It's amazing for a group who is so... Um, has so many boundaries and rules and uh, inequities that they're up against. That's not the thing they're talking about. What they're talking about is their own inner strength and their will to persevere and deliver. So when I look at the rest of the items on this slide, I just want to bring up a couple data points that I think are really critical. When we think about why do students stop out or drop out, the answer overwhelmingly for BIPOC students is that something unexpected came up. When you live with all of that wealth margin that we talked about earlier in these slides, ultimately a computer breaking down if you're learning online, a car breaking down, the loss of a job, 
a change in relationships. Something doesn't go right in a relationship with a mom or a dad or whoever the child care uh, caregiver may be or a caregiver for an adult that you're responsible for. It causes detrimental harm to these students who are trying to succeed. And, and we go on to look at that financial hardship. So just within our student populations reporting COVID-related housing insecurity, 50% of the Latinx and 40% of Black employees that we're working with are reporting COVID-related housing insecurity. And finally, when we think about how do they view education, the folks that we're talking with often have some limited exposure to higher ed in one form or fashion. But 58% of those frontline workers have a negative feeling about their higher their previous higher education experiences that we're trying to help remove those barriers, both mental and real, financial through partnership with employers and overcome systemic uh, uh, inequities to make sure that we're opening up opportunities and perspective for people. Now, that's enough from the employer point of view. Let's talk, Kate Craft, about what we're seeing in, in our higher ed partners. Great, thanks so much, Matthew. Excited to be here today and talk about what our educational organizations can do. So as Matthew has mentioned, systemic inequities lead to barriers for underrepresented learners. And those barriers can manifest themselves every, from the moment they think about enrolling in education all the way through to being successful, graduating, and applying that education towards a career or greater economic mobility for them and their families. What we have here on the slide, um, are some examples of the challenges that we see our underrepresented working adult learners facing today. Matthew mentioned a couple of them. Um, these are the 11 that we synthesized and distilled that we saw and we heard from our surveys and our research. And so we've included a little bit of key data there on the right side to support each one. So these challenges are really, they're, they're difficult, but in order to understand them and to move these barriers away from the path of these students, you must first understand them. So some of these challenges can be addressed by employers, as Matthew mentioned, while others are perhaps better suited to be addressed by academic institutions. As an example, employers can address financing education. It's a huge barrier, the number one barrier to going back to school. Employers paying for their employees' education can reduce that huge barrier. Another example is access to technology or Wi-Fi. Uh, a lot of employers are now thinking about putting those in the break room or elsewhere in the workspace to make it easy for employee students to access their classes online during their breaks and also will help, as Matthew mentioned, if something happens at home with Wi-Fi or computers, et cetera. Academic institutions, on the other hand, can also play a huge role in addressing these challenges. So that's intentionally designing programs that are de-biased, providing wraparound services like coaching and especially coaches who come from the backgrounds that their students come from, uh, designing programs for learning to, learners who themselves are parents, uh, for example, making sure live classes uh, aren't during school pickup and drop off time, etc. So to talk more about what academic institutions can do on the next slide here, we have framed up some key areas for academic institutions to foster DE&I. We interviewed many of our academic partners as guilds to find the 15 areas where institutions can make an outsized impact to foster diversity, equity and inclusion and support underrepresented students. So we have the five buckets here you can see on the slide. First, institutional commitment. These are tactics that educational organizations can implement at the leadership level. So that's having a strong DNI strategy, measuring diversity metrics, disaggregating that data as much as you can to figure out where there might be opportunities for improvement. And then the role of innovation, funding new knowledge around DEI challenges. Secondly, expanding access. This has to do with the role that marketing, admissions, and learner financial and tech readiness play in creating or breaking down DEI barriers to access further education. Third, academic success. We think of this as everything in the classroom, pedagogy, curriculum, mentoring, wraparound supports, the bulk of the student experience outside the classroom, coaches, clubs, career support, et cetera. And then fifth, faculty, staff, and leadership Having and supporting diverse faculty, staff, and leadership is crucial to the success of DEI efforts and to supporting diverse students. So I know we don't have a ton more time left, so I'm just gonna do a quick spin through these middle three student-facing buckets and practices, uh, starting with access. So these are some of the best practices we've seen across our academic partners when it comes to starting these learners, but it starts with expanding access to diverse populations. So first, marketing, how learners find out about your institution makes a big difference having representation, you know, images with diverse students help diverse 
prospective students see themselves at the institution and also being creative about marketing channels. So mobile, social media, community partnerships, all these things that really, really work to help get to and access student populations that really can benefit. Next, internal barriers. So addressing financial barriers and the cost of education. Matthew's already mentioned some great stats there. I will just add one more. Black bachelor's graduates carry twice as much debt as white graduates four years out from the degree. So there are clear racial disparities here. And so institutions can work hard to help students access financial aid, scholarships, et cetera, to understand um, how to address that barrier. And then streamline admissions um, in a study Fictional black students who mentioned race were less likely to receive response from an admissions officer than those who did not. So streamlining and de-biasing admissions processes is also really key. <laughs> Reducing external barriers. So technology access is a huge one. Um, Hispanic and black students are more likely to experience internet connectivity, hardware, and software challenges, which can really hamper your academic progress when you are an online learner. Um, when it and as an example, actually, Southern New Hampshire University, one of Guild's academic partners, they have been piloting providing no or low cost laptops and Wi-Fi sticks to certain learners. And they are already seeing in their data an increase in student persistence. Super impressive. Let's keep moving on to academic success. I'm throwing a lot of, lot of uh, hopefully some, some new and some interesting DNI strategies here at this group. Um, but on to academic success and how we can reduce academic barriers for underrepresented students. Um, so all three of these, pedagogy, curriculum, and advising and mentoring can have huge impacts on students. How they are placed in courses, what they are taught in courses, how they are spoken to in courses, whether those communications are asset-based or deficit-based can make the world of difference. A great place to start ensuring inclusive course materials is the syllabus. So a brief moment to talk about Guild Partner, the University of Arizona. They are a Hispanic serving institution, and they have a cruelty-free syllabus design that they use to eliminate penalizing authoritative language that is often associated with policing by many populations of learners. So no more syllabi in all caps telling students it's their fault if they miss a deadline. There are no exceptions. Instead, reframing it in a positive way, explaining reasons for policies and having a kinder, cruelty-free syllabus experience for students. Taking that kind of work is really important and then actually looking at all the courses as well. So the syllabus is just the starting place. We've also seen a lot of success around DE&I audits of entire courses to ensure diverse examples and sources are used. Third, advising and mentoring for diverse populations. Uh, as many of you on the line know, I'm no, no doubt is that it's best when done proactively. It is best when done in a networked way. And then honestly, it should be a bit aggressive. Uh, if you build it, they might not come. We at Guild have many coaches and we've also seen our partners have a lot of success using um, intensive online orientations designed specifically for uh, working adults to explain how to navigate the hidden curriculum of an education. It's like what an office hour is, who should go? And also just to help students understand that reaching out for additional support is not a sign of weakness, but actually a key to, to their success. And then bonus points if the actors in that online orientation video represent the identity groups of the students you most want to reach. Last but certainly not least, let's move on to wraparound supports. Um, when we looked at the research about what worked best uh, when it came to providing wraparound services, right, those out of the classroom services, there's a lot of research out there supporting affinity groups, the availability of mental health resources, ensuring mental health counselors themselves are diverse, and that they have the cultural competencies to work with diverse populations. As so much of this research shows, a sense of belonging is crucial to student success in long-term programs. So everything from marketing materials to syllabi, every piece of communication students get and see, those are all opportunities to tell students that whoever they are, they belong here. Guild partner Valencia College works hard to build that sense of belonging. They also run really great wellness programs to help students process difficult issues in small groups. That was a whirlwind tour of some of the findings when it comes to student facing DEI practices for institutions of higher education. I do want to make sure that we have a minute or two for questions and answers. So I'll hand it back to Matthew um, to talk to this last slide. Yeah, I, I won't take much time here. Uh, I'll just point out that um, we've got to do better. You see the data on the screen and education is the opportunity to do this. And, and we are seeing it. 
their results. It's not just an idea or an aspiration, but when we connect to education, there's a particular employer. When we see white students um, promoted at a 1.8x and black students promoted at a 2.1x, we're doing the work to start creating equity. We're on a journey. It's not enough. There's a lot of work to be done. That's a really small delta compared to what we need to create true equity. But ultimately, giving access and funding education through partners who are doing the right thing by our students opens up doors for those students that ultimately we're all here for. That's it. I'll just wrap up by saying that. Why don't we jump to uh, one of the q and I think we can run a couple minutes over Malika is what we're hearing from the team. So uh, why don't we jump in? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and we have received a great question. Uh, so thank you, Jeffrey, uh, for asking this question. Uh, the question is, how do your three roles, and so making the assumption you're referring to myself, Kate Kraft, and Matthew Daniel, shape how you view diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, I'm going to give uh, our panelists a, an opportunity to kind of think about this for just a moment. Um, I can say, you know, briefly just for myself, uh, my identities, so um, identifying as being a woman of color, African American, um, someone who um, comes from the, uh, the U.S. South, um, someone who is a parent, all of these identities frame and shape my approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, and I'm bringing my full self um, into the workspace. Now, my role specifically as the VP for diversity, equity, inclusion is to uh, prioritize, develop a strategy, and identify resources that are needed in order to move our DEI initiatives forward. And so that means um, connecting with key stakeholders, both within the organization, as well as across our external stakeholders, and creating platforms to amplify the voices and visibility of folk from historically underrepresented communities, again, both within Guild, as well as across our stakeholder communities. So now I think actually I'll pass it on to um, Matthew to see if you have a couple of uh, comments you'd like to share and then maybe on to Kate. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say this is that we embrace uh, our own unique points of view. I think you heard I come from many years of working with employers and HR. Kate comes from many years working with academic institutions. Uh, Malika is a wonderful person for the role that she's in because she straddled all of that. We embrace those points of view and we bring those to conversations. And so that we're clear, that can get really messy. Like that's that's hard work, but honestly, we do that. We bring, we bring this perspective, it's not just of our experience and background as consultants, but we each interact with different audiences and we bring voices from those groups into the conversations with us, we listen to those, we interview those folks, we talk with them, we hear what challenges they're up against, and we bring that. Now, to Malika's point, we all have uh, baggage and identities um, that we bring with us. I think both like who we are in the identity standpoint and from a baggage standpoint, the experiences that we've had and how those interact. And so I think ultimately um, we bring that even our own DEI council is intentionally a mix of representing students, representing employers, representing our own employees internally, uh, how we serve in the community is complex, but we bring all of that to the table. Uh, Kate, anything you wanna to add to that? That's great. Thanks, Matthew. Um, absolutely. I think we'll echo much of what Matthew said around thinking about the diverse population of students we as Guild serve. Um, I work super closely with academic partners, with our students, um, and I think it's really always fascinating to see where the biggest uh, opportunities are when it comes to DEI. and i So for instance, we've mentioned a lot of racial inequities. This is a huge priority for Guild. This is a huge priority for our academic partners and providers to serve students from underrepresented populations racially extremely well. There are also many other ways in which diversity shows up and that we talk about every day at Guild. So diversity of age, for example, many of our students are much older than traditional higher ed institutions. Um, diversity around ability status or need for accessibility. I think a lot of the early, um, all of the early institutions of higher ed around online spend a lot of time thinking about accessibility, right? What if your students are colorblind? What if your students um, need, you know, a, a reading assistant, et cetera? So there's a lot of 
early work been done there and it's really exciting to be part of continuing to push the conversation what can we do more to really help these populations of learners who have so much to add to these institutions and also so much to benefit from them so we'll just add that it's been really fun to work with all of this i know we're almost out of time um so I'll just yeah anything last words from anyone here thank you um, yes, yeah, so we are just about at time. Um, I did actually want to um, see if either one of our panelists had one last thing they wanted to say before we turn it back over to Hannah. I, I'll just go quickly and say, do the work. Um, this is messy and it is hard and it is uncomfortable, but whether we're in the workplace or academic, um, the work is worth it and we owe it to our students to do it. Yeah. Last thing I'll add, we at Guild talk a lot about the messy middle. And when you're doing DEI work, it can really feel like a marathon where you never know when it's going to end. And so we'll just encourage folks to really set the goals, set the targets and the strategy, but then celebrate the milestones. When you actually do learn things, when you actually do make some impacts, um, it just really helps keep keep the team, keep the institution going for the long haul, because it is a long haul. <laughs>